Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the fourth lecture of CS287, Advanced Robotics. A um, couple of logistical things first. One, your homework one has been released. It was released on Saturday morning, I think. It'll be due next week, Wednesday. So you have about eight more days to uh, finish homework one. Oh, can somebody close the door in the back there? Um, and I think that's it for logistics for me. Any questions about logistics of the class? Yes. Uh, we haven't get your own in a grade Say it again. In the grade scope, we haven't get your own in. Oh, yeah. We'll set up grade scope in the next couple of days. So yeah, for now you cannot submit yet. Um, but you should be able to complete your homework, just not upload your solutions yet um, into grade scope. Um, other than that, you should be good to go. Also, one thing we try to do with the homework. Um, is to ensure for every question that there is already a figure that shows what our solution is for some scenario. So you should be able to sanity check that you're actually on the right track and that things are working correctly. And then we leave a lot of other figures for you to fill in. But if you have the first one correct, unless you literally just copied and pasted that figure in your code, if you actually did it the right, the normal way, then the other figure should be correct too and you shouldn't have much to worry about. All right, so um, I again put on the board value iteration here just for your reference throughout the lecture because it's going to continue to be at the core of a lot of things we do. And in case you weren't familiar with value iteration before this class, it's nice to just be reminded all the time for now that that's what it looks like. So also put it on the slides here. In value iteration, we start with initializing v0 star for all states as equal to 0. then for, let me get a pointer. Then we iterate, and for every state s, we find the value for one extra time step. So we have i plus one time steps left to act. Optimal value from state s is the max over all actions of, if we were to take that action, the expected reward you get instantaneously plus discounted value from then onwards for the remaining i steps. And the argmax gives us the policy, and this is called a Bellman update, a value update, the Bellman backup, and so forth. And it gives us the optimal expected sum of rewards that we can attain from a given state with i plus one steps left and optimal policy. Now the tricky thing is if we have large state spaces, um, the, for all s that we have in there in various places just becomes impractical. We saw in last lecture, for example, for continuous state spaces, we cannot loop over all uh, states, and we looked at discretization-based approaches. Um, today, we'll look at a different way of uh, resolving this through something called function approximation. And we'll first study function approximation in the context of value iteration, and that will be the main topic for today's lecture, but then we'll also see how it uh, can be done in the context of policy iteration and the context of linear programming. Here's an example that a lot of people studied for a long time in uh, reinforcement learning, which is Tetris. Um, it's a simple game, a game of Tetris. At any given time, you are given a block. In this case, it's a two by two block, and that block has to be placed. So you can scoot this block to the left or to the right and choose which columns is coming down. And you can also rotate it by 90 degrees in either direction. For this block, that doesn't matter. But for other blocks, it could matter because you might prefer them to be oriented differently when they come down. The block keeps going down. Once it hits some obstacle, it gets placed. It might leave some empties. For example, if it were to come down where it's coming down now, this square here would end up being empty. And if you happen to have a full row at the bottom, which right now is not the case, there is a little gap here, or a full row anywhere. If you have a full row anywhere, um, entire row is full, that row clears, and that way you can make more space for the next blocks to come in. And so if you play this game really well, um, you'll keep clearing rows and never reach the top because game is over when your block gets placed all the way at the top and exceeds the box. All right. so. The state here is the exact board configuration plus the shape of the falling piece. If you count it out, it's about 2 to the 200 states, 
which is way too many to be able to enumerate them in a value iteration algorithm. So, the actions are rotation and translation applied to the following piece. And what we can then do is we can say, well, since we cannot represent every state explicitly, a value for every state explicitly, maybe we can define a function. And we can call upon that function to return the value. And how to ensure the function actually has a good value is a different question we'll get to soon. But for now, we'll just say, hey, there will be a function that will return the value to us. And that function might depend on some features. Um, and so the canonical features people have used for a long time in this game are these 22 features, also often called basis functions. Um, 10 basis functions, 0 through 9, mapping the state to the height of each column. Because the height of each column is clearly an important aspect of what, what you think about the quality of the current state. And that's the thing you think about when you design features for a value function. You say, what affects the quality of a state? Definitely height affects it. Then another nine basis functions for the delta between two adjacent rows. Because if you have a high delta, probably the value of that state is not as good as states with limited delta. Then one basis function that maps to the maximum column height. Because you can imagine that's a pretty dominant thing in terms of assessing the quality of your current situation. Then a basis function that maps state to the number of holes in the board. Because holes in the board are a bad thing. It's places you cannot reach directly. You'd have to fill a row above it somehow and start clearing things. That takes time, could be difficult to do. And so holes, if you count them, are clearly something that you can attribute bad value to. And then one basis function that is equal to one in every state. You typically need this because, um, well, it's essentially an offset. The average value over all states that you tend to visit, you don't want to somehow try to store that inside the features. Just like when you fit a line to a set of points, you don't want to be forced to go through the origin. Same thing here. You don't want to be forced to go through zero when all features are zero. And so then the value function v hat, which would be an approximation to the real value function, we would be represented as a weighted sum of those features. And if we have different choices for the parameters theta, we'll have a different value function. And then for any given state, you can say, return the value, please. And then you pass in the state. Then your code will compute the features of that state, 22 features, multiply and sum using the vector theta, and then return the approximate value of that state, hopefully. Here's another example, uh, Pac-Man. In this game, Pac-Man is who you are, the yellow guy here, and the ghosts are trying to catch you. Um, and you get points for eating food pellets, and you can actually catch the ghosts if you eat one of the power pellets. You get a brief window of time in which you're more powerful than the ghost and go eat them and get points for that. So what could the value function be? Let's think about it. What are things that will affect the quality of the situation? Any thoughts? We've done one example. For this one, let's, actually, there's this awesome thing we got now. This is a microphone that can be tossed around. So we're going to have a lot of interaction today, I hope. Um, so let's just see. Any thoughts um, if, you, um, if you had to design some features for a value function for this game? Raise your hand so I can, oh, very far in the back. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Let me start shorter. Do it. <laughs> All right, let's see. Everybody, careful. I'm, this might hit your head. Whoa. Oh, okay, yeah. Do I just do I just talk? Into I think you talk into it, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, distance to the nearest ghost. And I don't even have to repeat it. Everybody could hear that. Yeah. Great. Yeah, that seems a great feature because you'll have a, if that distance is small, you're in a bad situation. If it's large, you're in a good situation. Anybody else suggestion? Raise your hand. And what's your name? Brian. Brian can throw it to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> distance to the nearest food pellet. This is nearest food pellet. Oh, sorry, power pellet. Power, power pellet. Power pellet, even more powerful. If you're close to that, that would be very high value. I think, Olivia, you can have one. Uh, how many pellets are le left? Like, fewer is better? How many pellets are left? Fewer is better. That's an interesting question. That really depends on how you define the game, actually. Because if you get a high score for finishing the game, then fewer is better. 
And so it depends on the end score in the game, or if you only get points by actually eating pellets and eating ghosts, then in some sense the less pellets left, even though you're in a good situation, the expected sum of future rewards is actually low, which is kind of a very counterintuitive uh, thing to think about. Um, this often happens in other games too, where there's a timer or something, you only get a finite time to play. You often have to include that time into the features of your value function. You have little time left, there's not as much reward left to be collected. In this game, typically though, there's a big bonus at the end of the game, and so then it is good when there's very few pallets left, because you'll be about to collect that big bonus. All right, can you throw it back to me? Ooh, thank you. All right, that was fun. Uh, let's do more of that. Um, oh, here's an extra one that we didn't mention yet. If you're in a dead end, that's a bad situation to be in. Um, this map doesn't have any dead ends, but I guess if you're surrounded by two ghosts, it would be kind of the equivalent, like you're seeing here. That's really bad, right? Much worse than two ghosts coming from the same side, being very close, it's not that bad, but coming from opposite sides to you and being close, you're probably uh, gonna get caught. And then the value function would be the weighted sum of those features. So you say, okay, well, how much value for this state? Well, you turn that state into features phi of s, and then you multiply and sum to get a value. Now, the value will only be as precise as your vector theta helps you predict that value and as good as your features are. If your features ignore something important, your value function will not be able to be very precise. Here's another one. Um, actually, this one we covered last time. In a continuous state space, we could do function approximation by nearest neighbor. We could say the value of a state is the value of the nearest neighbor of that state among the states that we keep in our vocabulary. So, more precisely, we'll store values for the marked states, but then when we're asked about state s, we will not have a value stored. Well, we can look at the nearest neighbor, which is x4, and we can get that one. It's actually the same representation. It's, again, a weighted sum of features where the feature value, the feature vector is all zeros and one hot. The one hot is for the nearest neighbor. So here, the fourth entry is non-zero, is the one, because s is closest to x4. And then the theta values here are effectively just the values of each of those discrete states that we keep track of. But ultimately, it gives you the same thing, theta transpose phi as the value. And we saw you can do something that actually works quite a bit better by not doing snapping to the one nearest neighbor, but doing stochastic interpolation between a set of nearest neighbors. You can do the same thing here. You'll still keep track of values at discrete set of points, but now our point S will be mapped stochastically to x1, x2, x5, x6 in our transition model last time. Now we don't do it in a transition model, we just say, oh, when we're in state S, the value will be determined by its neighbors, and we'll take a weighted sum, and you can use the same weighting that I put on the board last lecture, a convex combination of the neighbors is living in phi s. So the feature vector phi is mostly zeros, but then non-zero for the contributing uh, states in our vocabulary, and theta contains the values at the states in our vocabulary. If you have something like s on the real line, you can imagine uh, that the value function is theta one plus theta two times s, or maybe a parabola being fit uh, as your value function or a higher order polynomial, or actually also a neural net. And I want to double click on, on this one in a little bit because that's one that's becoming particularly popular these days. Um, but I mean, ultimately what we cover today is not very specific to neural nets. It's, you know, you need some v hat theta, that is some function you can call that given a state will turn it into some approximation, hopefully close approximation to the value. So, the high level idea is that we, we will use an approximation v hat theta of the true value function v star. Um, theta is a free parameter chosen from some domain um, that typically is smaller than the domain of that enumerates the states, um, which could make it easier um, to find theta than to find a value for each state. Um, less parameters to estimate is the upside, downside, less expressiveness, because typically there will be many possible v stars, I mean, there will only be one v star for your problem, many possible values, so you don't know which one is actually gonna be v star, that cannot be represented by v hat theta because your function approximation cannot represent everything. If it could represent everything, it'd be just as expensive to use that function approximation as it is to just enumerate every single state. Now, 
When we have function approximation, kind of the simplest scenario is supervised learning. You have a set of examples, a status 1, a value for status 1, status 2, value for status 2, and so forth. You're asked for the best v hat theta, it would be maybe finding v hat theta, so setting of theta minimizes the squared deviation from the values that were prescribed. And you do this on a finite set, and you'd hope that on other states it would still be relatively good. For example, um, if you had points that maybe could be fitted by a line, you could say, I'm going to find theta that is the least squares fit of a line to the set of points. If you had a high dimensional feature space that you designed, you effectively be fitting a line, just a high dimensional line, which would be a hyperplane, and doing something very similar. That's just one way to do it. Another way to do it is to fit neural nets. Um, so let's do a little aside. I don't want to teach a lot about neural nets in this class per se. We'll just think of them as something we can use, but let's at least uh, cover the intuition or refresh it. So neural nets are uh, inspired by how the brain works. Uh, brain has a lot of neurons. A neuron has something called dendrites, which are the inputs. <coughs> then has a um, nucleus, where some computation happens in some sense. And then, depending on what comes on the dendrites, that nucleus might decide to fire a signal along the axon, which will then branch out to next set of neurons that does the next set of amount of processing that needs to happen. OK. Mathematically, this can be represented as follows. I mean, I'm not saying exactly represented, but in a reasonable way represented for our purposes as the cell body is something you doing a weighted sum of the inputs. So the inputs are x. 0, x1, x2, and so forth. The weights correspond in some sense to the strength of that connection between the neuron that outputted x0 and this new neuron. The weight w0 represents the strength of connection. And then after that calculation, weighted sum of inputs, then it'll output something on the axon. But before it does that, it does a quick uh, kind of nonlinear transformation on it. Uh, why? If you keep everything linear in your neural net, it turns out all you can represent is linear things. because Linear after linear after linear is still linear, and so the best you get is linear. But if you put a little bit of nonlinearity in there, then you can get something much more general. What are popular nonlinearities? Uh, the nonlinearities are shown in blue, and their derivatives are shown in yellow on this plot. Um, so in blue, there, first one is a sigmoid, goes from 0 to 1, so it squashes. Then the weighted sum of inputs will be a number that is then put on this horizontal axis. And then you look at what's the sigmoid value for that point on the horizontal axis. For example, if your weighted sum of inputs was roughly 4, you'd land up here about 1. And the functional is shown below. It's g of z is 1 over 1 plus e to the negative z. Hyperbolic tangent is essentially the same function, but uh, scaled up a factor 2 and then shifted down by 1 um, and goes from negative 1 to plus 1. And then rectified linear units are making the activation 0 if you're negative and keep whatever it was if you're positive. OK, these are just examples of popular ones um, that you know, at some point you'll probably already have used or will use in the future. Neural network itself is not just one neuron. There will be many neurons. And so there will be inputs, x. And then la typically layer by layer processing, though in principle there could be skip connections from early layers to later layers. But the most typical setup is just layer by layer processing. And then there's an output layer, um, which is the value y. And so y, the output is a function of x, which is the input, and w or theta, depending on what you call it, the weights in the neural net. So you can ask yourself the question, imagine we, this is our value function. It's a function of x. This is our value function. Can we represent it? with the neural net shown on the right. Who thinks we can represent it with a neural net shown on the right? Raise your hand. Who thinks we cannot? You're torn. OK. Um, so let's see. Each neuron, so the neural net on the right has five neurons in the middle in the hidden layer. As we know, what a hidden layer does, it takes in an input, then it can apply nonlinearity and generate something on the output. Let's think about it in a very simple way. Imagine we have rectified linear units. What's going to happen is that each of those neurons, depending on the x value, for a while will output 0, and then will output a weighted version of the x value. Could it be positively weighted, negatively weighted. It could also be the other way around. It could be linear for a while and then become 0 when x is higher. So those are the only two options. Every one of those 
outputs a piecewise linear function that has a slope for a while and then horizontal or horizontal for a while then a slope. If you sum five of those functions together, you can not get the function on the left. We can similarly reason about um, the sigmoid. Sigmoid goes between zero and one. What that means is that each of those units for a while will be zero and then become one or if the weight sign is flipped, it'll be one for a while and then become zero. And it has some weight going to the output, so it'll be a weighted version of that. It will be some number for a while and then zero, or zero for a while and then that number. If all you have is effect effectively a bunch of bumps to your function up or down five times, you can again not represent the function on the left. Neural net is too small. But you might think if we have you know, a very large number of things in the middle there, then we can track along with the function. We need an extra bump, we go up, an extra bump to go down and so forth. And every bump could be another neuron that we use to generate that bump. It might require a lot of neurons in the middle, but if we have enough of them, we should be able to track the function. And so this universal function approximation theorem um, came out in the late 80s, early 90s, a few different variations. Um, the exact phrasing is shown here, Hornick's theorem 1, Hornick's theorem 2. In words, um, it says, given any continuous function f of x, if a two-layer network has enough hidden units, then there is a choice of weights that allow it to closely approximate f of x. Where closely means that any given time, and anywhere along the function, you'll be within some epsilon. Once you specify an epsilon, there will be a resulting number of units you can pick. You want epsilon smaller? Sure. You'll need a larger number of units, but for every epsilon, there will be a number of units that will do it for you. There's many versions of this theorem. Um, and the details don't matter so much, but uh, I hope the intuition makes sense that every neuron can give you a variation in the output. And so the more neurons you add, add the more variations that on the function that you want to fit that you're able to track. Now, the more variations you're able to track, um, also things can become tricky. You might fit, let's say in this case, a degree 15 polynomial, but it could be something else. You have a very expressive function approximator, and then it turns out it does some weird, quirky things because it's so expressive and has these weird bumps in the beginning and the end here. That's called overfitting. It's where you put all your effort in fitting the training data, but then on held out data, you might not do so well. So to avoid overfitting, there's a few things we need to keep in mind. Uh, you could reduce the number of features or the size of the network, so don't make your network infinitely large necessarily. Um, regularize theta. That is, every weight, bring it closer to zero, so it has less opportunity to make these weird bumps. And early stopping. Early stopping means that you stop training updates uh, once the loss increases on the holdout data. So you're training, 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 and you don't get to train on the holdout data, but you get to check. As I'm doing better on my training data, am I also improving on the holdout data? If at some point it gets worse on the holdout data, it means you're starting to memorize the training data rather than discover the pattern that's in your training data that will generalize. Um, I will say often this is not really mentioned when people do value iteration and so forth. People often just write algorithms in the form of, okay, and you'll see it here too, you know, fit, fit your value function to some, some data and repeat, but you want to be careful that you don't overfit. Okay, so we know how to do function approximation through supervised learning. We just, you know, these days can call a black box, say here's some data, some of his training data, some of his holdout data, input-output pairs, and just find a parameter vector theta that fits this uh, input-output pattern pretty well. Um, but where do the supervised examples come from in our case? So let's work through this together. This will be the main algorithm we're going to cover today, which is value iteration with function approximation. Um. So we already have value iteration here. That's going to be our starting point. But the difference is that we're not going to be able to deal with looping over every state. Um, so now, let's see, is this big enough for the back? Good. Value iteration. with 
function approximation. So instead of setting v stars 0 equal to 0 for all states, which we have to do there, we don't really have v star 0 available for all states. It's too many states. So, but we actually also know that the alteration will converge no matter the starting point. It's a contraction. It brings everything to the solution no matter where you start. So we actually don't have to worry about it as much. Um, we don't necessarily have to initialize things to 0. The meaning will be lost if we don't initialize to 0. The meaning of this being the optimal value for i steps to go will, oh, there should be i plus 1 here, i plus 1 steps to go will be lost if we don't initialize with 0. The meaning then will be the optimal value with i plus 1 steps to go if when things are over, we get whatever we initialize v0 star with, some kind of n value. Um, but we know that that n value will disappear through the contraction, so um, we just have to run it long enough and it'll disappear. So we'll just initialize. We don't have v now, we don't have v table, but in it, theta 0, just somehow, it doesn't really matter. Pick some, if you have um, a linear function approximator, you could just set it equal to, to 0 if you want. And then it'll be 0 again, and it'll work as before. If you have a neural net, you're not going to be able to find a setting that always makes the output 0. Or if it does, that's typically not a good setting for a neural net if it always outputs 0. So um, you just randomly initialize it a reasonable setting. Then we iterate, just like we did there, for i equals 0, 1, 2, and so forth, up to some large enough horizon. Then step zero in our iteration is pick sum S prime, which is a subset of the full set of states S. And typically, the size of S prime will be a lot smaller than the size of S. Otherwise, there's no point in doing this. If you could hit every state S, why even bothering with this? Then we can do our Bellman backup on those states. So step one, Bellman backups. What does that mean? For all s in s prime, we compute, I'll call it v bar, but I mean, just to show that it's not the same v as over there, v bar i plus 1 of state s is equal to max over actions sum over s prime t s a s prime and then r s a plus gamma v i sorry, v theta i because we don't have v i v hat theta i s prime over here. So it's the same as the equation we have over there. The only difference is that instead of having the actual v i star available at state s prime, we need to rely on our current estimate v hat theta i. Once we have that, we actually have a bunch of pairs. This results in pairs um, of states and estimates of vi plus 1 for that state. And then step 2 will just be supervised learning. So we will find theta i plus 1 is the arg min over theta of sum s in s prime of v theta of s minus v bar i plus 1, which is our target values of s squared. Now, I'm writing it this way, and this is how a lot of people write it. That's kind of a simple way to write it. But keep in mind, actually, you want to be more careful. You don't necessarily want to find the argument of this. You actually want to gradually optimize this, right? You want to 
do gradient updates on this objective and have a holdout set on which you track whether you're still doing better on your holdout data every update you make or you're already starting to do worse. But very often it's just written this way, so I'm going to write it this way. I'm going to give you the extra warning, though. Um, be careful that you don't overfit to that latest set. Any questions about this? OK, let's take a look at this in action for the Tetris case. So remember, we get a reward of one every time we place a block. I made a small Tetris world here so we can step through this exactly. You can see every detail of how this operates. Sync state slash game over state is reached when block is placed so that part of it extends above the red rectangle. If you have a complete row, it gets cleared. So our set S prime could be this set of states. A state consists of the current situation on the board as well as the next block you're supposed to place. We'll have slightly less than 22 features here because there's not 10 uh, columns. It's a narrower board, um, but we'll have the same types of features that I mentioned before, just on a smaller board, which ends up being 10 features. So height of each of the columns, delta between neighboring columns, maximum height of all overall columns, um, number of holes, and one entry that's always one. We initialize theta 0 this way. Uh, why this way? I mean, that clearly doesn't look like random numbers. I picked it this way because I can easily step through the next set of slides this way and showing you how it works out. Uh, the math kind of works out not too complicated. Um, so let's see. What's the value? We pick our first state in our set of states as prime on which we're doing backups. So this is the equation. This is the Bellman backup we do for that state. It's the max over the four actions available to us, because there's four placements we can choose. Also, I'm assuming here you cannot rotate the block. Otherwise, it just like, doesn't really fit on the slides anymore. So you have to place the block in the current orientation. Um, so there's four actions available. And then for each action, there is what happens on the board. And then there is what happens in terms of what's the next block that shows up. And so for each action, there's actually two possible next states. One block showing up, the other block showing up. But the board is deterministic. You know what's going to happen there. What I showed here is what happens initially on the board. But actually, over here, this will clear two rows. Same over here. So actually, what we end up with is this situation over here. So you might imagine that that's probably the move you want to make. But that doesn't mean the values already reflect this, because we have just randomly initialized the weights on the features. So who knows what it's going to say. So. After we've done this, what we can now do is we can go back to our features, compute the feature values for the state we just looked at, and use the initialization theta 0 to find um, the values that we estimate currently. So there's a special state in row 3 there, the sync state. Game is over. So we don't really use the features and the and the theta vector there, we just say when it's a sync state, game is over, value is 0. <coughs> Everything else, we use theta times phi to find the value of that next state. Look, the reward is 1 everywhere, because placing a block is where you get reward for here. So there's nothing in your action that directly affects how much reward you're going to get right now. It's always going to be 1. Um, OK, then we can compute it. We get some uh, values for those next states. It turns out that initialization I chose does make this better move look better. So I picked some reasonable initialization, putting negative weights on features that we want to be low and positive weight on features we like to be high. And we get a value of 6.4 calculated here. Yes, well, hold on, hold on. Is it important to make features independent of each other? Oh, oh thank you. So is it, um, is it important to make features independent of each other? So it's fine to have features that relate to each other in principle. But 
what will naturally happen is if you have correlated features, you'll essentially they'll get more weight in some way. And so you'll more, you'll more heavily fit to those features early on, but over time, hopefully it'll just work out. But the learning path with a lot of correlated features might not be as good as with independent features. So if we do this, um, we can do this for the second state, go through the same kind of procedure, look at all the next states, compute the values in the next state, um, no sync states here it seems, or oh, a couple sync states actually. Um, get a bunch of, third state, fourth state. So for all states in S prime, which is a small subset of all the states that could exist in this world, we have computed values shown over here. Now the next step in this process is that we do a minimization. We have target values and we have our function approximation format. Um, and we try to get the function approximator to be close to those target values. We can run least squares on this, gives us a new set of values, a new set of theta values, which in turn gives us new predictions for those states and other states, what their values would be. Okay, now again, I'm showing it here in a simple scenario, but when you run this, you want to be careful. You want to have a holdout set and you don't want to just overfit to the training set, you want to make sure you're actually learning something that generalizes rather than overfits. Um, so be careful about that. Um, if you have a neural net function approximator, the main difference is going to be that you even need to worry more about overfitting than with a linear function approximator. And so often you do only a small number of gradient updates on the objective or early stopping based on a holdout set. Um, and you could actually um, have this set as prime be relatively small, decide that to be the case, just do a small number of updates and loop through this um, more frequently. Or you could have a bigger batch size S prime and then you need to loop through it less frequently. Um, it's kind of just a hyperparameter setting how big you want to make S prime. Um, as you make S prime smaller and smaller though, keep in mind you start losing more and more the interpretation of the values that you're calculating along the way being the optimal values for I plus one steps to go. But that's fine, we're often not looking for that interpretation. But if you were, let's say you had a problem that you really cared about, let's say horizon 20. That's the problem you want to solve. You want to act optimally with exactly 20 time steps to go. You're going to want to take a very large batch size S prime and store the values of each iteration so that when you act, you can do a one step look ahead against the correct value for the number of steps of look ahead that are still available to you, or number of steps of execution still available to you. Um, but often you just care about infinite horizon and then the batch size doesn't really matter. You just can take small batches, large batches, whatever is essentially faster to run on your machine is what you would typically choose. Now one question you might have, do we have any potential guarantees here? Um, can we guarantee something that we still get something cro close to the real value function? To study this, we're going to consider the following variation on the algorithm. We'll assume we iterate over all the states. So I've been telling you all this time, you can never have S prime equal to S. It's not practical, you can't run it. But for the theory we're going to do, we're going to actually assume S prime is equal to S. Why? It essentially eliminates one type of failure mode, which is a failure mode where the reason you don't do well is because you have a too small set S prime, and you, so you, you don't capture enough signal. What we're going to focus on is, Assume you do it on all states, but then after you found the exact VI star, you approximate that VI star with something else that your function approximator is able to do. So the way people often, what people often call it is a projection. You, ha you initially found the exact thing, did the exact update over all states, and you projected onto a smaller space of functions. You pick the best function in the smaller space of functions to fit the exact thing and then you go again. Um, again, this is not trying to say that going forward you would ever run this. It's to be able to think about the theory in a more precise way. And also what happens is if in this case we have a negative result, it actually shows that, well, definitely in the sampled case it's not going to be great either. Um, because even if we did backups on all states, it already fails. Well, what now um, if we only sample a few states? Let's see. Um, next thing you want to do is so.
So we're going to cover in the second half of lecture is going to be some of the most theoretical work we're going to do in this class. So let's take a short break so that you're mentally ready for uh, what comes after this. And I'll leave this up. All right, let's uh, restart. Any questions about the first half of lecture that I want to resolve first? OK. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at an extremely simple example. As simple an MVP as you might ever encounter. In fact, you'll probably never encounter it except for this lecture and when you teach this to somebody else in the future. This example comes from uh, Ben Van Roy, back when he was a PhD student at Stanford, working with uh, John, uh, back when he was a PhD student at MIT, uh, working with uh, John Tsitsiklis. Ben is now a professor at Stanford. And he taught me this example there. So, MVP has two states, x1 and x2. Actually, let me give myself a little more space. x1 and x2. The reward is 0 for going from x1 to x2. And that's also the only action available to you in x1. And the reward is 0 for going from x2 to x2. And it's also the only action available to you in x2. So no matter what you do, if you start in x1, you'll move to x2 and stay there forever, and you'll have 0 reward. If you start in x2, you'll stay in x2 forever and get 0 reward. It's a very, very simple MDP. Optimal, optimal value function, 0 in both x1 and x2. <laughs> we can read this off. Now we're going to introduce function approximation and see if with function approximation we can find the optimal value. So our function approximator will be our feature value phi of x1 is going to be 1. Feature value of x2, phi of x2 is going to be 2. OK? That means if we look at the value, our estimated value, v hat at x1, is going to be 
theta, the number that we're trying to find, theta times phi of x1, which is theta times 1. And the value we estimate in x2 with our function approximator theta is theta times phi of x2, which is theta times 2. Let me just rewrite this as theta and 2 theta. It's a little easier to read. So theta and 2 theta. So whenever we're running value, we will run value iteration updates, and then we'll have to find a theta that's hopefully as close as possible fit to the values we found, and then evaluably theta and 2 theta. Great. OK, so. Writing it again here, v theta will be 1, 2 times theta. This is the full value function for this space. OK? OK, now let's take a look. We look at one update, v after one update for x1. What should it be? Well, Bellman backup, that is going to be our target, right? So it's going to be 0 reward plus discount factor gamma times the value we had, our v theta for x2, because we land in x2, and our v after one step for x2, or we have one step to go, um, is 0, because instantaneous reward is 0, plus gamma times while we land in x2, v theta of x2. So this, if we write it out, is going to be 2 gamma times theta 0. Let's call this our theta 0. We initialize with theta 0. And then um, here we also have 2 gamma times theta 0. Now we need to do a least squares fit. We want to find a theta 1 such that 1, 2, which are our feature values times theta 1 should be as close as possible to 2 gamma theta 0 and 2 gamma theta 0. If you do the least squares fit, which I'm not going to crunch through the numbers, but if you just do least squares on this, what you get is theta 1 equal six over five gamma theta zero. Okay. All right, so now let's think about this. This, since theta 1 is just something multiplied with theta 0, and there was nothing special about theta 0, we can actually know what theta 2 is going to be, 3, and so forth. We can just read it off. And so we'll know that theta i is equal to 6 over 5 times gamma to the power i times theta 0. All right, so what do we see happen here? We run, we're, this is a case we're running, ex, we run exact Bellman updates, then we do least squares fit for the value function, repeat, and we see that the parameter theta, well, it depends what theta zero is, but assuming theta zero is not equal to zero, then if, if six over five times gamma bigger than one, then diverges to infinity times theta 0. So if theta 0 was positive at first, it'll go to positive infinity. If theta 0 was negative at first, it'll go to negative um, infinity. This is kind of crazy, because we know the value function is just 0. And we know that there is a choice of theta. It's, it's not like our function approximator doesn't have the power. It has the power. It totally has the power. It should just set theta equal to 0, and it's done. I'll have found the optimal value function for this MDP. But if 
essentially, if gamma is relatively large, so doing calculation over a long horizon, more things can add up, errors happen here, and the errors happening here make this go wrong. That least squares approximation just doesn't bring it in the right direction to make sure this converges. So that's a, this is the simplest example I'm aware of where the following properties are satisfied. Um, our function approximator can represent the optimal value function, but unless you initialize theta zero equals zero, so pretty much any initialization of theta zero will result in divergence. Like essentially guaranteed divergence, assume, you're, assume this is satisfied here. So a gamma that's bigger than 5 sixth. And usually we pick bigger than 5 sixth. Often we pick 0.99 and so forth. Oh, exciting. Question. Let's see. You're in a difficult position. Let's see. Oh, wow. Nice catch. So the second value uh, equation where it says 0, gamma, uh, B theta, yeah, that This one? Wouldn't that be x2? Because you can't go to x1 from x2. So let me, let me read it aloud. This is the value of x2. Yeah. In our update, is 0 plus gamma times v theta, and this is x2. It's just poor handwriting. Oh, um, okay. it's, definitely, it's definitely x2. Let me make it a clearer 2. Yeah, thanks for the clarification question. Yeah, it's hard when sitting though. Let's see. Oh, not for you. Wow. All right. Any questions about this example? So this is a negative result, just to be clear, right? This is a very negative result. This shows that even a simple, simple MDP where you can represent the value function exactly with your function approximator can still have divergence. Um, very negative result. So, this is the math done in the slides. Hopefully we can do better though. Hopefully this is not the end of the story, right? Um, so, let's revisit operators. So, we talked about this two lectures ago. Um, an operator G is a non-expansion with respect to a norm if, if you apply g to two different inputs, um, you bring those inputs closer together. So think of, for example, the Bellman update as an operator. It takes in a vector, or an infinitely long vector potentially for an infinite state space, a vector, and turns it into a new vector. That's an operator. You go from a certain space, which is vectors of some dimension, to the same space, but you have updated that vector. G is an example of an update, um, a generic notation for an operator. It's a non-expansion if things don't move apart. And why might you care about this? Well, we saw that if things are a contraction, which is a little stronger than this, if then after the update you're within gamma of what you were before, you're guaranteed to converge. Because um, you always get brought closer, which actually means if you have a fixed point, a J star in this case, and you apply the operator to that, it stays the same. You apply it to the other thing, let's say J2 is, J, is uh, the optimal and J1 is just something you started from, then this means you don't move away from the optimal thing with this operation. If you're a gamma contraction, it means you move actually closer to the optimal thing. If the operator F, another operator, is a gamma contraction with respect to a norm, and the operator G is a non-expansion with respect to the same norm, then the sequential application of the operators G and F is a gamma contraction. And if we then sequentially apply them, we might have convergence. In fact, we will have convergence um, because we know contractions uh, converge. So to make this concrete, think of F as the Bellman update. We know the Bellman update is a gamma contraction in the infinity norm, the max norm, same thing. Then our function approximator well, least squares, we clearly saw it doesn't satisfy this property because we would have had convergence. But if we had a better function approximator, one that actually satisfies the non-expansion property with respect to the same norm, then we would have a combined contraction and things would converge. 
So this gives us a recipe for what kind of function approximators we might want to look for. Um, I want to pause, pause here, see if there's any questions about this. OK. So what might be some function approximators that are non-expansions? Any thoughts? Yes. Times it by zero. Say it again. <laughs> Times it by zero. What, what, what by zero? Just, just like multiply it by zero. Multiply by zero, always. That is a great example of a <laughs> non-expansion and a gamma equals zero contraction. It's like the best convergence properties you could possibly have, except probably to the wrong thing. Yeah, Though okay. it's probably not useful. But. Yeah, but it's a good one. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost. Thanks. <laughs> well, let's think about some function approximations we've already covered. We saw nearest neighbor and linear inter interpolation with convex weights from your neighbors. Who thinks those might be contractions? Not contractions, non expansions. People are very torn on this one, it seems. Who thinks they are expansions, possibly expansions? OK, so everybody's still making up their mind, which makes sense because it's not, not that easy to wrap your head around. Um, it turns out they are non-expansions. What's the intuition behind this? Where's my pen? Let's see. Why are they non-expansions? Um, well, if we think about what we're doing, let's say we have two functions. But in general, this could be vectors. It doesn't have to be functions. But let's say we have two functions, a special type of vector. And I have a function, function 1. And I have a, let's say, function 2. I can think about how far are these functions apart right now. And then after I replace those functions with the function approximation to the functions, how far are they then apart? So let's replace with the function approximation. We're going to do, for this one, let's say we do um, the convex combination of the neighbors. So we're going to, we have, we keep this point, then we have this point, this point, this point. So our function approximation will result in replacing that one by this, this, this. And the function approximation on the other one is the same function approximation operator. So we're going to have the same points in our grid. And we're going to replace that one by the blue function. Think of these as straight lines connecting these blue dots. And I'm claiming that the distance between the blue and the red function is smaller than the distance between the two black functions shown. And I'm going to claim this is not coincidence. This is always going to be true when we do this kind of um, interpolation. Intuitively, why is this happening? Well, if you think about how far apart are two points on the, let me, let's see, no green available. Let's take this point here. How far are these two points apart between the blue and the red? Well, the red one is a convex combination of these two points here. So if I called this one here, maybe um, y1, 
y2 in red, and we have y1, y2 in blue, and then we have a y bar in the middle, and a red y bar in the middle there. It'll be the case that red y bar equals some alpha times y1 plus 1 minus alpha times y2. The blue one, y bar, is same alpha times y1, the blue y1, 1 minus alpha times blue y2. If I look at the difference between those, so I subtract, I do y blue minus y bar blue minus y bar red, and I'm going to look at the absolute value of that thing. Well, let's look at what happens. I'm going to have absolute value of alpha times difference between the two y1s plus 1 minus alpha times difference between the two y2s. I'll put it the wrong way. Mm. What happens next is, well, let's say the largest difference between any two points of the black curves we call it something delta max, then this thing is small and equal to alpha times delta max plus 1 minus alpha times delta max, which is equal to delta max. Let me step through this for a moment. I define delta max as a max difference between the corresponding points on the black curves. So y1 minus y1 has to be smaller than delta max. Same for y2 minus y2, it's just smaller than delta max. You can fill delta max in here, make it a smaller than, you can do a bit of math, and then show that the whole thing has to be smaller than delta max. So because everybody becomes, every point becomes a weighted combination of its neighbors, the furthest you can be apart is as far as your neighbors were apart from each other, and typically going to be even less apart because interpolation is happening. And so that's the key idea, is when you're, when you're a convex interpolator like that, um, you'll be some weighted combination of how far your neighbors were apart. And so less apart than your neighbors were apart in the original two curves. And you can do the same derivation for uh, nearest neighbor, because nearest neighbor would just mean that one of these alphas is zero, and the other one is, well, either alpha is zero or alpha is one and only one of them will be contributing, but other than that is the exact same thing going on. And this is not specific to being a one-dimensional thing with just two neighbors. With any number of neighbors, you can do the same kind of math. As long as it's a convex combination of your neighbors, meaning that you're an averager, the same math will hold true. The distance you're apart after averaging will be less than whatever your neighbors had as distances. Okay, so what we did just now is kind of an informal version of this derivation here, where it's written in terms of we have J is the Bellman update. Um, sorry, J, J is, um, J is the, the value function here. Pi is the projection operation. And so we look at two possible value functions, J1 and J2. We apply a projection operation, then we have an averager operation, which is spelled out over here, what it actually is. And then after you do some math, um, you find out that it's a non-expansion. Now going back to what we saw before, if we have a non-expansion combined with a contraction, we have a contraction together. And so we have guarantees for a fixed point here. 
Um, so if we have a, let j star be the optimal value function for a finite MDP with discount factor gamma, let the projection operator pi be a non-expansion with respect to the infinity norm, and let j tilde be any fixed point of pi. So we project, and it doesn't, doesn't change anymore. Um, suppose j tilde minus j star is smaller than epsilon, then we will converge by doing Bellman updates and projections. So Bellman update t, projection pi, the value function that's close to the real value function. So they didn't fully prove this, but there's actually some interesting nugget of information here. It's saying that if, if there exists a fixed point of your projection operator where you project onto your set of functions, there is something in your set of functions you project onto that is close to the real value function, then you will actually find something close to the real value function, which is very different from the negative result we saw. Because the negative result we saw with the two states, we had something extremely close to the real value function. In fact, we had exactly equal to the real value function in our projection set but it still didn't converge because of expansion happening. Here we're saying if two conditions hold, one, there is something close to the real value function in your set of functions, in your function approximation set, and your projection is a non-expansion, then you'll end up close. Okay, that's, that's good news. Now, I want to give you a little bit of intuition as to why linear regression is not satisfying this property that we had so beautifully here. So let's take a look at what goes wrong with linear regression. Imagine we have two functions again, which are our current value function estimates, two possible value function estimates. First one looks like this. And then second one is going to look like this. Now imagine we do a least squares fit to each of those functions, accounting for every single point in each function. Okay, so we're gonna account for every single point in each function. Not subsampling anything like that. We'd, well, let's account for every, every point on here, least squares fit. Our line will probably be more or less this. Um, maybe a little lower running there. And then for the other one, it'll probably be something that looks like this. OK, those are our least squares fits to those functions. But if we see what happens is that how far were they apart before? Probably the furthest point before. I didn't draw it exactly right. Oh. Need to draw this a little more carefully to make this all work out beautifully. So this one goes this way. This one goes this way. So the furthest point apart before was this over here. Now the furthest apart is this over here, which is actually a little more. And if you draw the plots carefully and do the carefully design the example, you can actually expand this more and more and keep this smaller and smaller if you want to. Um, one way to do it would be to just draw this wiggle here almost like a line like that. 
and then you'd have even bigger effect on the ex how much it expands. This is an example from Jeff Gordon, um, but it, it kind of explains the notion. What's happening is that unlike with the averager type function approximators, which um, use existing values in a convex way, here in least squares, as you know, least squares so it looks ultimately something like this, x transpose x inverse x transpose original values y, and then another x here, something like that. And so this thing over here is just not an averaging operation. It could be really anything. Um, and so because it's not averaging the initial values, you don't get the non-expansion property. Now with neural nets, it's a little more complicated and people haven't done a fully careful analysis, actually. I would say it's, it's future work for somebody to do to figure out with neural nets exactly what's going on. Um, it's a bit of a couple of, th couple of things happening there with neural nets. One is that, well, you just do a stochastic gradient update so you don't change your function very much. So maybe that has an effect on maybe making it a little easier. It's a very rich function approximator. So um, if you think about, can I represent the real value function? You can probably be close. And that, again, gives you a little bit of leverage. But I'm not aware of any kind of results showing that, you know, with the right kind of update on a neural network function approximator, you are guaranteed to have a non-expansion and hence guaranteed to converge. Um, but intuitively, probably something like that could be true. Um, or maybe not. Maybe there are some nice counterexamples because linear regression is kind of a neural net, just a very simple neural net with least squares loss. So it's, it's not super clear to me kind of what the final say will be there, but it's something that, I mean, if you want to do something more theoretical for your final projects, uh, that could be something to, to think about, kind of what would this analysis do on neural net function approximators. Now, um, we've seen the main ideas. And now we can rapid fire repeat them for the other settings. I, I see your hands up, but since we have about 10 minutes left today, I want to make sure we get through this in a contained way and then we'll take question after lecture. Policy iteration. Remember, kind of a, another way of solving for the optimal value function and optimal policy. You would have a policy evaluation step current policy is fixed, it's like value iteration but with a fixed policy, and then take the policy as the best one step look ahead policy against the value function that you found, and we, we knew, we showed that the one step look ahead against the value function you found for the previous policy is actually better than just using the previous policy. You get a policy improvement and repeat. Well, we'll need function approximation in the policy evaluation step now. Now there's something very subtle going on here, and the subtle thing going on here is that in this function approximation step here, there's no max anymore, which simplifies it. It's a simpler operation, which we liked about it. it actually also allows you to prove some additional properties about this update that we cannot prove about the validation update. So we're going to actually get stronger uh, properties of convergence with policy iteration, with function approximation, than value iteration. Here is the bottom line. Approximate policy iteration is a, is a contraction. Okay? If, let me spell this out more precisely, if we do weighted linear regression, weighted linear regression, weighted by the state visitation frequencies under the current policy, you have a current policy, and you're going to weight your regression by the visitation frequencies. Actually, very easy to do. You just run your current policy, and you do your, your regression based on the states that you visit, your sampled states, because those come from the distribution of your state visitation frequencies. So you can just Monte Carlo sample on your current policy, and then use the states you get that way. Then the resulting projection from doing that regression is a contraction with respect to the weighted two norm. OK, that's, that's interesting. Now in addition, the policy evaluation Bellman update is a contraction with respect to the same norm. If we have, so 
sorry. This might I might have this might have to say a non-expansion. Let, let me just don't take that literally for now. But is a contraction or non-expansion? But it doesn't matter because we have a contraction here. Together they're going to be a contraction, and we have guaranteed convergence. The math is a lot more hairy than the math we saw today. Um, we covered it in fall 2008, and some notes of that, so if you want to look at that, you can go there. We're not going to go through that here today, but we can actually work through the math and see that this actually works out. So this is kind of interesting. This means that, um, remember in the beginning I said we're going to see not just validation, but also other methods, because sometimes when we have to make approximations, it could be helpful, even though in the exact tabular case, it's kind of crazy to do it. You know, also consider policy iteration, maybe. Well, here's an example for where that's the case, where policy iteration will behave uh, better with linear regression. I mean, the value iteration with function approximation will be fine when you have a non-expansion against the max norm, but least squares is not a non-expansion against the max norm, but um, least squares is a non-expansion against this weighted two norm, so that's nice. Now, Let's see how many slides we have left. Let me do this one on the slide. OK, let's step through this carefully. What do we have here? I'm, gonna, I'm trying to show here that if you're a non-expansion or a contraction against different norms, it doesn't mean that that will work together in a way that you converge. It really matters that things are against the same norm. So, we start over here, our initial value. I found this on the web. <laughs> our initial value is over here. We contract with a value iteration update against the infinity norm, the max norm. Max norm means the maximum value becomes smaller, so it's boxes. We, to be a contraction against max norm, we need to move into a smaller box. And we did. We moved into a smaller box. But Lo and behold, we actually moved into a point that has a higher 2 norm. The next step is a contraction against 2 norm. We're always projecting onto this line. If you project into that line, the 2 norm distance between points will become smaller. Because essentially, if you re reorient your coordinate system, what you're saying, I only pay attention anymore to one of the coordinates, the other one gets ignored. And the, the norm of things when you only look one coordinate versus both is going to be smaller with just one coordinate. So we project into the line. So we have a contraction against the 2 norm, but we actually moved to a box that's bigger. So we expanded in the max norm. And then this process repeats. We contract in the max norm, but we actually expanded the 2 norm. And then we contract in 2 norm, but expanded the max norm. And so this is a very simple drawing showing that if your norms are not the same, even if you have contractions against both of these norms, if you alternate, you can actually get something that doesn't converge at all and diverges to infinity. If you're curious about more of those things, we recently actually wrote a paper going a little bit in the direction of um, trying to look at why there can be divergence in Q learning, which is a sample based version of, of value iteration. Um, it uses the Q values rather than the V values, just for some practical reasons. But um, that's another starting point if you want to think about this more. Now, we also saw the linear programming approach. Um, linear programming formulation looked like this. Minimize a positively weighted sum of values such that the value is bigger than the Bellman update value. So we're pushing this down against the Bellman update value. Um, and the lowest one satisfying this will satisfy with equality. And so we have the optimal solution to the um, problem we're trying to solve, optimal value function for this MDP. Now, um, what if we do function approximation? What does that mean? We're going to sample states, and we're going to use not v, but some function approximator. We want to continue to be a linear program. That means our function approximator has to be linear. Otherwise, it's not going to be a linear program. So we're going to have a linear function approximator. We're going to swap in this thing over here. Theta transpose phi of s comes here, comes here, comes here. And then we'll have a subset of states that's being sampled rather than all states. It turns out for this, there is also a guarantee. Um, 
Well, first of all, we know LP solvers will converge, so we'll have no divergence issues. It's an LP. We know how to solve that. Then in terms of solution quality, um, assuming one of the features, a feature that's equal to one for all states, just to make sure we have an offset, otherwise we might be too constrained, and assuming S prime equal S, which is kind of an extreme scenario because we typically can sa sample all states from S, but assuming that, this guarantee holds true, which is saying that the optimal value V star is close to what we find phi theta in one norm weighted by mu zero. And how close is it? Well, we can, here's a separate theta. We can find the optimal theta in our function approximation space. Here it is really as if you did supervised learning. If you could do supervised learning and find the best approximation of your V star, how close will you be? And this, this will be some number. If your real value function is easy to approximate with the features you have, then this will be a small number. If you have a really bound feature space, this will be a large number. But naturally, you can't expect to do much, but you can't do better than this. This is saying, what is the best function available in my function approximation space in terms of closest possible to V star? So this is the best you could possibly do. And actually, turns out, you can get quite close to the best you can do with this linear program solution. There are also weaker probabilistic guarantees that hold if you use an S prime that is a subset of S. Um, essentially, what you have here is a constraint optimization problem where you sample constraints. Not all constraints are in your optimizer. You ignore some constraints. But intuitively what happens is for this uh, specific program, there are a lot of constraints because there is a constraint for every state action pair. And we know the state space, especially state action space, is much smaller than the number of variables we're going to have in theta. So the number of constraints is much, much higher than the dimensionality of the space we're solving over. And so if you're solving a problem where the number of constraints is a lot higher than the thing you're solving, it will look something like this. You might be trying to find an optimal value in this direction, which might be this point over here. But most constraints at the solution, only a small number of constraints can be intersecting and active. And most constraints will actually not contribute much and be all in various places and not have influence on the solution point you find. Of course, these exact ones will have influence, but there will be other ones that are sufficiently nearby that your solution will not be affected much if you subsample. And so there's a guarantee for that also. Uh, the work by the Fares and Van Roy shows this. That, and it's a general property if you have a highly constrained problem with many, many, many constraints compared to the dimensionality of the space, well then uh, a lot of these constraints will not actually contribute to your solution and it's fine to miss them in your sampling. All right, that's it for today. Thank you.